evening and welcome to Hardfire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and I'm with you for another half hour of current events from a libertarian perspective. My guest tonight is Dr. Chris Garvey, the libertarian candidate for Attorney General of the State of New York. And that, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm just going to start right off, Chris, by asking you, what is the office of Attorney General going to look like when you are in there as the first libertarian to hold that office? Well, it'll be guided by the libertarian principle, which is that people should be free to do whatever they want except initiate force, the threat of force, or fraud against other people or their property. So that's going to be, you'll be able to predict all my positions uh, based on that principle. Okay. Now, as I understand it, the Attorney General is sort of the lawyer for the state of New York, the advocate for the state, uh, and... Um, you have some sort of hand in both sim uh, civil and criminal prosecutions, correct? Uh, that, that's correct. And, uh, and defending the state. Probably uh, most of the Attorney General's work is uh, occupied by defending things that the state has done. However, uh, the, state of the Attorney General of New York is not an appointed position. It's an elected position. So my primary loyalty is going to be the, to the people rather than to the other two branches of government. Okay, now maybe you can tell us a little about what differentiates you as the Libertarian candidate from the two major party candidates, the Demoblicans and the Republicans. Well, Janine Pirro is something of an authoritarian uh, from my uh, point of view. She's uh, in favor of the war on drugs and she's also in favor that's of... That's the so-called Republican candidate. Uh, that's the Republican <clears throat> candidate and she's also ag uh, against uh, private ownership of guns uh, under the guise of something called sensible gun legislation. Oh, oh yeah, we know what that yeah, means. Yeah, well I, I did see her on the podium with Hillary uh, at an anti-gun rally. As a, I was there as a counter-protester. And they were advocating trigger locks. And I did ask the police who were guarding the uh, public officials if they had their trigger locks on their guns. And <laughs> they didn't seem to be using trigger locks. Well, of course not, because if you want the gun to be useful, you'd better not have a trigger lock well, on Well, that's, that's true, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and who, God help us, is the Democrat candidate? Oh, the Democrat candidate is, uh, is Andrew Cuomo. Uh, Andrew Cuomo doesn't believe that uh, people who, who live in subsidized housing have uh, any access to the Bill of Rights. He was willing to abrogate both the Second Amendment and the Fourth Amendment by doing compulsory uh, searches of people's apartments when he was uh, running housing and urban development. Is that so? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Poor people don't really have rights uh, if they're if they're accepting any money from the government, which of course is one of the dangers of accepting well, of course, money from the government. According to the Democrats and the Republicans, nobody has any rights. We only have privileges, which the government can take from us at any time. Uh, that seems to be uh, a prevailing view among some people. Now, Cuomo has some other problems too, and I, I don't know if he himself is a crook, but certainly when he was running housing and urban development. He facilitated a lot of misappropriation of government money. In 1999, which seems to be the worst year, $56 billion were uh, disappeared. Uh, now, according to a Cuomo spokesman, that money wasn't missing. It was just unaccounted for. Oh. Uh, so I don't know where it went. I can't say whether it was stolen or not. But uh, people who were at her ha uh, Housing and Urban Development at the time indicated that uh, the policy seemed to be for, in favor of shifting the money away from individual renters with vouchers to uh, large uh, entities, contractors, people who could build public housing units despite the availability of housing that could be rented close by uh, because such people were capable of giving large donations to campaign funds that uh, poor individual uh, people who receive rent vouchers were not likely to give. Okay, well, that's uh, not perhaps provable, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Well, I don't know what happened to the $56 <clears throat> billion, but it's a lot of money to simply disappear. It is that. Yeah, and now if, if Mr. Cuomo, now that there are those who say that housing and urban development was designed for that purpose, not to subsidize housing. That was sort of a, the excuse to create it, but it was actually created to allow the people in charge to distribute taxpayer money 
Well, it was, after all, created by the king of boondoggle, Lyndon Johnson. Yes, and Mr. Johnson did become very rich uh, <laughs> after his uh, uh, tour as president, Indeed or so. perhaps during. Well, uh, even before that, I believe. But uh, now back to the subject of attorney general. Uh, what are some of the major initiatives that uh, will have your name on them when you uh, take over the office of attorney general? Well, the attorney general doesn't really do initiatives because he doesn't initiate legislation. He's not hes not a legislator. He doesn't sign. He doesn't have veto power. But you he can sign pay greater them. attention to the enforcement of That's some correct. laws rather than others, That's correct? correct. And, of course, I wouldn't be going after the war on drugs. But, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to slack off because there are a lot of local prosecutors, a lot of federal prosecutors. So. Uh, even if I didn't pay any attention to uh, the war on drugs, there are plenty of other people who will, and I don't know that there's much I can do to stop them as mm -hmm. Attorney General. I certainly could you then could you though say to the people in your own office, uh, we this are not is going to be this is a very on. low, low, low priority. Exactly. Anything yes. that is certainly anything that <laughs> violates the libertarian principle would be a very low priority with me, and uh, certainly anything that. Uh, is unconstitutional, well, I don't feel an obligation to enforce unconstitutional statutes, and so I certainly would not. And in fact, I might even side with the individuals who are being, who are having their constitutional rights abused in a lawsuit against uh, the state. Okay. Now, um, one thing that uh, we had better discuss in some depth at this point is um, just some some of the libertarian principles as they pertain to our legal system, because an awful lot of our viewers have not too good of an idea of what libertarianism consists of, and maybe you can tell us how that would translate into the uh, legal system. Well, if, if a law <coughs> is not concerned with making sure that people don't commit force or fraud against other people or their property, it probably has no business being on the books. If a law is intended to steal other people's property, then uh, I'm against it. Uh, now, of course, uh, I can't really do away with taxation, and that is, of course, the, the major form of theft which occurs in New York State. There's also eminent domain, which is another form of theft in New York State. Okay, now, uh, that's one thing that we ought to maybe inform our viewers about. A lot of people, when you tell them taxation is theft, well, that's the standard libertarian position, mm -hmm. but a lot of people will say, what? Taxation is theft? What are you talking about? Explain that. Well, you're taking money from some people and uh, often giving it to others, and it's not necessarily in relation to any service that the people you're taking it from is. It's taken by compulsion, by force. Effectively, I mean, if you resist taxes enough, it's taken at gunpoint. Uh, so it is a form of initiation of force against other people or their property. Mm -hmm. Now, as Attorney General, my powers would be limited. I can't do away with taxation in the state of New York, I don't think. Um, not that I wouldn't like to, but uh, the powers of the office are somewhat limited. Mm -hmm. You could, I suppose, rule certain state tax laws unconstitutional. No, that's done by judges. Uh -huh. I could give an opinion that certain state laws are unconstitutional. One of the uh, gun rights organizations that I belong to suggested I give an opinion like uh, that was given by uh, uh, the Attorney General uh, of the United States that the Second Amendment is an individual right, and of course that is my opinion. but. Effectively, I would have to convince a court of that, and uh, the New York State courts have, uh, for many years, uh, since 1911 with the passage of the Sullivan Law, uh, seemed to feel that New Yorkers don't really have a right to bear arms. Okay. Um, would you be able to do anything to, to reverse that trend, to make it a little easier for people to uh, defend themselves? I could investigate discrimination in the issuance of gun permits. I mean, almost nobody in New York City gets to use to to obtain a carry permit, uh, but there are certain people who do. Uh, the the uh, publisher, the New York Times, Bill Buckley, uh, uh, Howard various Stern, I believe. Howard Stern, uh, various uh, senators, um, and the public officials, uh, rich people, Donald Trump. These people do get to uh, get full carry permits in New York City, um, and uh, most people don't. Now, if you last time I looked, there was a criteria if you carried more than three thousand dollars in cash from your place of business, and you really had a good excuse for not doing some direct deposit means or something, they might give you a gun license to protect that money. Uh, oddly enough, the statute forbids. Uh, the use of uh, a gun simply to protect property. The, a gun can only be used to protect life. And, uh -huh. But 
for most people, your life is not of sufficient value to warrant the issuance of a gun permit <laughs> in New York City. <laughs> your life is not valued. Well, that, that's uh, pretty much the way a lot of people in government today think. Hmm. Um, so um, you mentioned that uh, there's a good possibility of corruption um, at some very high levels. Um, and uh, certainly the attitude of a lot of the people in uh, uh, state and local governments today would uh, tend to bear this out. So as um, Attorney General, are there certain areas that you think might be rife with corruption that you might go after? Well, I would make a presumption that any board of elections that chooses direct recording entry voting machines where you just touch a screen and the electrons go somewhere mysteriously and maybe count your vote, uh, would probably be engaged in some sort of fraud. The, the evidence is absolutely clear that direct recording machines have been messing up wherever they've been tried. In, uh, right now, Maryland is thinking of junking their direct recording machines uh, because they just don't work properly. The best system, well, our lever system isn't so bad, although when I ran for governor in 98, uh, the unofficial count of 7,000 votes somehow went to 5,000 votes mm -hmm. after they'd been well, officially counted. Well, it seems to counted. me that the best way is to just use plain old paper ballots and have somebody sit there and count them by hand. That's what they use in the United Kingdom. Or, and nobody ever complains of vote fraud in the United Kingdom. Well, that's, that's true. And, and in fact, there's something very close to that, which would conform to the HAVA statute, the federal statute that is requiring us to junk our old machines, uh, which is, uh, paper ballots, optical scanners. Uh, you, you go into a booth, uh, privately mark out your ballot, uh, taking as much time as you need because these booths are just pieces of cloth and, and frameworks. They're cheap, they're easy to make. You can have as many of them as you want in a site. And then when you're all done marking your ballot at leisure, you come out, you go over to a machine, you put it in face down, it scans the ballot. If there's, if there's a problem, like you've overvoted or undervoted, it'll kick it back and say, are you sure? If you've made a mistake, you can fix your mistake. If you can't fix the mistake, they'll give you another ballot that you can do properly. Uh, and then you'll put it in, and if, it's, if all is well, or if you don't want to fix your mistake, uh, you put in your ballot in a matter of a, a second or two. It scans it, drops it into a sealed box. Your ballot has both been counted and set aside where no one can tamper with it. Well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. As Attorney General, would you be able to uh, influence the Board of Elections to institute such a system? Well, I would tell the Boards of Elections that if they selected the direct recording entry, which is about five times the cost of the, of the paper ballot optical scanners, uh, there must be something influencing their decision. I would presume that there is something influencing their decision. I, I would then have to prove it in a court of law. but. I would think that I would be able to because things like that tend to leave a trail. And um, if I were a Board of Elections, I wouldn't want to bet on the fact that I couldn't prove it. Uh, okay. So that might have some influence on the Boards of Elections. Uh, the facts otherwise should have an influence on the Board of Elections. If you're using direct recording machines, you have to have one machine for every voting station. It's not just a bunch of closed booths where you can mark off the paper ballots. You have to have a, a, a machine that's going to be probably assigned to the district, and everybody's going to have to wait while you punch all the buttons. There's also provisions in the current act saying that handicapped people have to be given enough time to use these machines with whatever aids they're going to be using. So a blind person would have to listen to the entire ballot read to him, and read to him enough time so that he could understand what was being read. That could take half an hour. Well, don't they have braille ballots, for heaven's sake? Uh, not on the direct recording screens. They're just touch screens, so the screens have no capability of rising into braille. And not every blind person knows how to use braille. But you could use a braille paper ballot. Well, uh, that's what would seem to make the most sense to me. Well, it would. That's one of the reasons why it makes much more sense to use direct, uh, not to use direct recording uh, entry machines, but to use the paper ballots. And if the machines cut out, if the machines fail, as they did all over Maryland this year for their primary, uh, with a paper ballot, if the op optical scanner goes down, you have a stack of paper ballots that can be counted later. Okay. Uh, but uh, with the direct recording entry machine down, the whole thing comes to a stop and everyone has to wait for a technician to arrive from somewhere to figure out this mysterious machine and make it work. 
Well, like most libertarian candidates, you're, you seem to offer the most sensible, simple solutions. And it's got a paper trail, so it's harder to steal elections. If you have a direct recording machine hooked up to a modem, there's nothing to say that that election can't be rigged from Venezuela or uh, Dubai or whatever country the, uh, the principals of that company who are generating the mysterious software which nobody has been able to see outside that company, they can simply call up on a modem and dictate the terms of the election. Uh, now, that's been done in various places around the country, even with paper ballots, where uh, there's one county in Florida uh, where um, it was actually documented that although the voters vote on white ballots, there were blue ballots, a stack of blue ballots that actually got counted in the, uh, in the, in the punch card machines. Okay. Uh, Why does this not surprise me? Well, <laughs> um, it shouldn't, yeah. Okay. But uh, now, we have heard it said over and over again, and I'm inclined to believe it, that the um, American system, political system at all levels, is just rife with corruption, and we need to throw the rascals out somehow. But um, <clears throat> why do you suppose there is such resistance to um, making a shift away from the two main parties, which um, most of us agree are pretty much one as bad as the other? Well, for one thing, they make the rules. So it becomes very difficult for a minor party to, to gain any status uh, okay. and to there. It may be that the people who own the banks, the media, and the politicians are all the same people. And so you're not going to get a lot of media attention for a, an upstart organization. Uh, since they're running the government, the rules are going to tend to be stacked against them, as they certainly are in New York State. The rules okay. are very much stacked against any but new now, party. As Attorney General, would you be able to make any changes that would make life easier for <coughs> not just libertarians, but for other third parties? Uh, I could choose not to defend the Board of Elections when they're, when they're attempting to do something unconstitutional. I could, uh, and in fact, the present Attorney General has done has done that in at least one case that I'm aware of where I, uh, I was part of a group of, uh, I represented the Libertarian Party among other parties that uh, uh, attacked certain unfair aspects of the election law. You were not able to register as a Libertarian or a Green Party person or uh, uh, any of the other, of, of five minor parties uh, which, uh, uh, are not had not gotten in the last election 50,000 votes for governor. Now that's something that has always puzzled me. I, I wonder why would you want to register as a member of a party that has no legal standing, no permanent ballot status? I would just as soon register as a Democrat or a Republican so that I can vote in their primaries and maybe throw a wrench into the works. And that is of course a strategic uh, reason to do that sort of thing or or to get the, ca the candidate who's the least, uh, <coughs> who you consider the least of, uh, of the evils when you're, uh, if you think that he's going to be elected over a third party candidate. Right. Uh, so there are plenty of reasons to belong to a major party, but there were people who did not wish to belong to a major party and wished to actually state their affiliations. Uh, they're not looking to run for office. They don't need a major party to get themselves on the ballot. And by, uh, by stating their affiliation with, say, the Libertarian Party or the Green Party, they make it easier for those parties to find them and appeal to them for support. Okay, and speaking of finding third parties, I think I've got to take a little break here and talk about how you can find out more about the Libertarian Party. In New York City, you can visit the website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party, which is www.manhattanlp.org. And there you will find information about the local chapter and when and where our monthly meetings are. And it will also provide links to both the state and the national libertarian parties where you will find a lot more information about what libertarianism is all about, what are some of our initiatives, <clears throat> what are some of our objectives, and what's going on with libertarians across the country. It will also provide, if you drill deep enough, a link to Chris Garvey's blog spot and you can learn more about his candidature for uh, attorney general. 
Uh, you could also go to ny.lp.org, which is the New York State Libertarian site. Okay. And uh, there's, uh, if you click to candidates, there's a page full of candidates, and uh, I'm among them. And you can click on my, on my link, and that will take you to my blog spot. Great, great, good idea. Uh, and for um, those of our viewers who don't want to be bothered with that, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about your uh, credentials. Where did you get your law degree and what have you been doing with yourself since then and so forth? Okay, well I went to Sacred Heart High School in Yonkers. Uh, I well, so you say way to be instead <laughs> of way to go. Uh, I don't know if I would do that. Well anyway, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, I went to uh, Columbia University, studied engineering for a couple Her of years, and, and uh, graduated from Columbia College mm -hmm. uh, at Columbia University. Um, then I, after uh, going into the charter boat business for a while, well, after serving as a medical instruments uh, a technologist uh, at a uh, uh, manufacturer of coagulation timers, uh -huh. uh, I then uh, ran a charter boat for a few years and then went uh, back to school to go to law school at Cardoza, Univers uh, Card Cardoza Law School, Benjamin N. Cardoza Law School at Yeshiva University. Uh -huh. um, and uh, have been so working. So you certainly have a, an ecumenical education, put it that way. Uh, that's true, although actually religion wasn't really taught at uh, Yeshiva, uh, at, uh, at their law school, but I certainly was exposed to it. Um, I've uh, uh, been the chairman of a, uh, a, a winter sailboat racing fleet that uh, was primarily founded so that uh, people who had been blackballed at the uh, various yacht clubs plus uh, Jewish members back in 1958 when it was founded could uh, actually go sailboat racing in the winter because in those uh -huh. days uh, there was a lot of discrimination in the major yacht clubs uh, okay. up down Long Island Sound. Um, so yeah, I suppose it's been fairly ecumenical. Um, after that I became a patent lawyer and I've been a patent lawyer ever since, uh, teaching sailing on the weekends. I've still got a license to operate well, actually, it's being renewed uh, vessels carrying passengers for hire uh -huh. uh, from the United States Coast Guard. And uh, I have a number of other interests. Uh, okay, so, and uh, uh, you're a bit of an American Revolution buff, aren't you? Uh, yes, I've, I've uh, engaged in historical reenactments, uh, uh, teaching kids how a musket operates. And uh, actually, I, I did an interesting thing last spring. I went up to West Point and uh, uh, helped uh, show the cadets uh, the evolution of, uh, of small arms uh, and uh, the long arms from uh, the 1600s through uh, World War II. That sounds like great fun. Do you get a lot of kickback from uh, from parents when you uh, show their kids how a musket operates? Uh, by, I wouldn't use the word kickback, feedback perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, no. Oh, about, you no, know, guns no. are evil by by definition, and so you on. You don't get so much of that. No. Good. Uh, once or twice, you'll have someone whose child is afraid of the noise, uh -huh. uh, and uh, possibly afraid of it because of some ideological thing that the parents are putting out. But um, uh, mostly, uh, kids say uh, things like "Shoot the gun, Mister! Shoot the gun!" <laughs> we don't. We only use powder when we're doing demonstrations. Whereas we don't fire a ball when we're. Uh, when we're doing demonstrations. We well, that's too bad. <laughs> I can think of a few people you could aim at. No, libertarians are nonviolent. <laughs> we, we do not uh, engage in uh, the initiation of force. Oh, well, but we have lens. some rather shameful thoughts at times. Uh, <laughs> not I, no. <laughs> no. OK, um, so um, would you be able, as attorney general, to use your office as a bully pulpit for libertarianism, or would you try to do that? Oh, sure, sure. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, and uh, in some cases that might be all I, uh, I'm able to do. Uh, the uh, uh, anything the attorney general actually accomplishes would be either accomplished through uh, through the th threat of litigation or litigation, and you have to do that within the system of the, the framework of the court system. Mm -hmm. So I can't just go off and uh, and be king. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a libertarian, I wouldn't want to. Okay. Uh, well, when the state of New York was first established um, in the late 1780s, um, um, well, I guess we started calling ourselves the state of New York in 1776, but uh, in effect in the 1780s, we were fairly close to a libertarian society. I wouldn't say we were there all the way, but we were close. But since then, over the p past uh, 225 odd years, 
we've been moving steadily away from libertarianism. Now, why the heck is that? And is there some way that we can reverse that trend? Well, war is the health of the state. And it seems with every war, we sort of move away from libertarianism. It may be that just before the Civil War in New York State, we had abolished slavery. Uh, we, we were at our most libertarian. Um, and then, uh, then we have a war, and the power of government grows, and then the Civil War ends, and the government starts to shrink again, and then somebody trots forth another emergency, you get another war, and uh, the power of government tends to ebb and flow with the, uh, with the additions of war, only it tends to rise a little bit more than it shrinks back. Mm. Is so it always a war, or is it sometimes the fault of a... Uh, rather charismatic authoritarian figure, such as a Teddy Roosevelt, for example. That can happen, but the people don't tolerate that sort of authoritarian figure if you have prosperity and if you don't have a threat from the outside. Uh, someone said that the, uh, the art of politics is uh, frightening people with an endless series of hobgoblins, most of whom are actually imaginary. Right. Um, and I may have that quote wrong, and I don't recall who said it, but uh, I think it might have been H.L. Mencken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, my, my favorite uh, similar quote is, um, diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy while you look around for a brick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, well, you should have your bricks ready, mm -hmm. which is why the right to bear arms is so important. You know, some people, uh, think that uh, banning guns will actually save lives, but the, over and over again it hasn't. In the, the gun capital, the, the murder capital of, of, of America right now is Washington, D.C., and they've had draconian gun laws for the last 30 years. And yet in every state that has liberalized the right to carry pistols so that people can defend themselves, the criminals become deterred by that. It's much more of a deterrent than the death penalty. Uh, That's the, what I've been told. The I'm death penalty is not a deterrent because no, people no, don't think not. about that. But people do think, gee, there's a one in seven chance that my victim could shoot me. And that tends to deter a lot of criminals from committing violent crime on people. So as Attorney General, would you be able to make it easier for people to uh, keep and bear arms? I don't know. I'd certainly like to try. But uh, again, we have limited power. We have the existing courts. We have judges who have this anti-con mindset. And all I could do is try to persuade them, perhaps, if I have the opportunity. That well, we'd that's certainly that's like to give you the opportunity to try. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd just like to remind our viewers to get out there on November 7th and vote for Chris Garvey for Attorney General of the State of New York. And that's all we've got time for tonight. So thank you all for tuning in. I'm Joseph Dobrian. Good night from Hardfire. <laughs>